Musa, wake up South Africa. You've been sleeping far too long. Wake up South Africa. Let me start by offering my obeisances to Srila Prabhupada, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutale, Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swami Niti Namine, Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pachani Ne, Vishesha Sanyavari Pascha De Satani, Panchakopa Tirubis Chakri Pasindu Eva Cha Patita Nam Pavani Bio Vaishnava Bio Namo Namaha. You know, many, many years ago, we were in Hawaii, you know, Hawaii. Hawaii, tropical country, like just like Juhu, Bombay. And Prabhupada was walking on the beach one morning. And with him, of course, we had sannyasis. One of his one of his sannyasis, he's very known all over the world now. He has his kind of own branch, branch of Krishna consciousness, you know, from Srila Prabhupada. Uh, I forget what the name of it is called, but Siddhasvarup Ananda. So he was in his room one day and there had been some complaints about him. He was, Siddha Swarup, he was one of the very first, um, what do we say, like ro he went rogue back in the ISKCON days. So he formed the very first faction from ISKCON and uh, he didn't like a lot of the things you know, he thought our preaching tactics were too heavy, our book distribution tactics were too, too heavy, too severe. So there was always this rift going on. You know, that's one of the things even now to this day, we think, you know, people will say, I wish Prabhupada was here. You know, if he was here, he could do this and he could straighten out this and he could do this. These things were going on when Prabhupada was here, you know. Two, if you have two people, you have difficulties, you know? So anyway, he was a sannyasi. Prabhupada had given him sannyas a few years before, and he traveled with Prabhupada. Prabhupada always knew that he had a very big following and that he was going to be very influential right? in the future to thousands, tens of thousands, maybe more um, people, devotees in the future. So Prabhupada's main concern was that whoever was preaching, they understood what to preach. You know, that was the main thing. This way or that way, that they, they preached pure Krishna consciousness as he had given it to us. But anyway, these things were going on. So one day, I was Prabhupada's servant at the time, and it was a, another, another feature about Srila Prabhupada that's, that was so wonderful. Um, Whatever was going on in Prabhupada's room, he never called for privacy. In fact, there were times when the devotee would come in and wanted to speak to Prabhupada more or less quietly, you know, privately. And Prabhupada would say, we have no secrets. <laughs> who can say that? Uh, who can say, we all have our secrets? Huh? And that's one is pure devotee of Krishna. We have some secrets. You know, and maybe some of us don't have secrets, but in general, material life means we have secrets. We have things we hide, you know, we keep behind closed doors. And what was so wonderful with Prabhupada is he had didn't have secrets. And that's something, you know, I saw the title of this class was My Prabhupada. And um, I was thinking about that too, of course, he is my Prabhupada, but he's also your Prabhupada. We, we can all make Prabhupada ours, just like we can make Krishna ours. I've been listening. Someone just gave me this wonderful thing. Oh, I don't have it here. <laughs> this wonderful little device with a nice speaker on it, and it has in a little uh, whatever your card in there. It has all of Prabhupada's audio classes on it. So I've been listening to Prabhupada speaking 
very wonderful to hear him speak. You know, reading his books is very nice, but hearing him speak, it's even more powerful. And then, of course, if you see him and hear him, that's even more potent. But anyway, Prabhupada was saying, Krishna is our friend. Krishna is in the heart. And he said, of course, he said, Krishna is our only friend. Of course, one who gives you Krishna, he's also our friend. So Prabhupada is like that. He's, he's not just my Prabhupada, just like Krishna is not just my Krishna. He's everyone's. He's our true friend. He sits in the heart and waits for us. No matter what we do, he's always right there waiting for us to turn to him. So Prabhupada's the same. He, he very much, I do feel he's my Prabhupada because my experience with him, I see his compassion. You know, I was witness, as you said, I was with Prabhupada two and a half years, personally, which was a very long time to be with Prabhupada. And I'm sure I made many, many offenses. And despite that, Prabhupada was always not just my spiritual master, he was a friend. Prabhupada took care of me. Prabhupada nourished me, encouraged me, tolerated me. This is real friend. So anyway, in this room, you know, Prabhupada would say, we have no secrets. We're devotees of Krishna. We have no secrets. So whatever discussion was going on, sometimes I would find myself in that room sitting with Prabhupada. You know, you know the saying we some people say that like like the fly on the wall. You're just sitting there <laughs> invisible, but you're seeing, you're hearing. So I had that opportunity. And Prabhupada would never say, you have to leave now. This is private. Sometimes the devotee speaking with Prabhupada may be like that. In fact, that happened to me a few times where they, no, shut the door on me. But that was never Prabhupada's mood. But anyway, in that room that day, this person, Siddha Swaroop, his full name, he was initiated Siddha Swaroop. Then Prabhupada gave him sannyas right away, Siddhasvarupa Ananda Goswami. Now he goes by the name of um, Paramahamsa Siddhasvarupa something or other. Anyway, he's on. he has a big, big following all over the world. And of course, he presents Prabhupada's books. They have their own way of doing kirtan, very Western style kirtan and all. He's been very successful. He was the very first. Um, Iskan, what do we call it? Krishna West? You may some years ago, you may have experienced uh, on social media, online, and all, or read Dayananda Maharaj. He wanted to start this Krishna West. You know, it's not just for Indians, it's not just him Hindu thing. Prabhupada did the same thing when he went to Africa, right? He said it's for local people, not just these Indians, not just the Hindus. That's fine, they're there. But Prabhupada wanted to speak to the to the local people. And when he went to Africa, of course, he said, where are they? Because the temple room was filled with Hindus, Indians. And Prabhupada said, you have to bring in the local people, the African people. So Prabhupada traveled around the world specifically to see that the people, the indigenous people in the different countries, they had the opportunity to take the Krishna consciousness. So in this meeting, there had been different things said. Hmm. Prabhupada was also very interesting how he would speak. We know one of, the, one of the things we hear is, and it can be used against us, especially those we call the, um, what is it? The, um, you know, you have the management and then you have the, the, uh, the followers like us, you know, the common people. So um, we're told not to criticize. Hmm? We can be chastised by those in charge, temple presidents, GBCs. But we say they're criticizing is that's that's offensive. Vaishnava Aparad. Well, Prabhupada had a very unique way of saying he would never say, you've done this, you have done this. 
he would always preface this with, they say, <laughs> or someone has said that you have done like this. In that way, he would take a very passive way of initiating that conversation. So he, he, didn't, he didn't chastise directly. And he did that in this instance with Siddha Swaroop. He didn't say, you're not doing this. You're not doing this. He, he specifically in front of him, we're all sitting there, five or six of us in the temple, temple president, Prabhupada secretary, myself, Siddha Swaroop. And he said, they say, <laughs> he said, they say that you don't that carry your danda. You're a sannyasi. And he responded, he said, well, Prabhupada, he said, when you travel, he said, especially on the airplane, he says, very difficult. He said, to carry your danda, they may not let you bring your danda on board. And, and immediately Prabhupada looked and he pointed to his own secretary, who was also sannyasi. He said, he's traveling with me all over the world. He's carrying his danda. So in this way, Prabhupada, responded to the first question. And then he said, you're a sannyasi. Sannyasi brahmachari, very, you know, very important positions. They represent the society in so many ways, particularly how they look. You know, immediately you see a brahmachari, you see sannyasis, you see certain way they dress. So then he said, um, you're a sannyasi, and yet you're keeping hairs. And that's how Prabhupada wouldn't say you have long. He would say you're keeping, you're keeping hairs. And he said, well, Prabhupada, if I shave my head, I catch a cold. And Prabhupada looked at him. He said, here in Hawaii, you get a cold? <laughs> They have no winter in Hawaii, you know, it, it, it doesn't happen. He said, so here in Hawaii, you get a cold? And then he just, yes, Prabhupada. And then Prabhupada just, and then he, and then me, who is usually very, very quiet, like you say, uh, you, you introduce me very nicely as Prabhupada's servant. Many times I get introduced, they say Prabhupada's secretary. And I always say, no, 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 I was not a secretary. He had very specifically secretary, two different services. The secretary was there, servant was there. And of course, all over the world, no one likes to be called a servant. Huh? We know that everywhere, whether you're in Africa, South Africa, you're in America, you're in Europe, you're in India. That's an insult to be called a servant. That means you're, you know, you're sudra, you're low class. So I, I generally, I'll get introduced that way, especially at colleges or universities. They'll say personal assistant or secretary, secretary's favorite, because that's a high post, being secretary, that's not. And I'll generally say just to <laughs> say, no, no, I was servant. Uh, where else in the world? Who else but us, but devotees and eh? Krishna consciousness our whole desire is to become servant, not just to servant, but we want to become servant of the servant of the servant of the servant of the servant. That's our position. That's a very safe place. Once Prabhupada said, we, he said, we don't call ourselves devotee. He said, but you can call yourself servant. This is our, because even devotee, he thinks I'm not devotee. Everyone else is devotee. Me, I'm not a devotee, but servant, yes, trying to serve Krishna. So anyway, I'm in this meeting, and I had that same kind of mentality as many of my god brothers, and I thought things he was doing was not the way Prabhupada wanted. So then I said, well, Prabhupada, I said, this morning, I said, Maharaj, <laughs> he's right there in the class. And uh, I boldly said this morning, he gave class in the temple room. And many of the devotees were there. And of course, many of the devotees were specifically his followers. 
they came to Prabhupada when he when he came to Prabhupada, he had over a hundred disciples himself in his group. So when he came and surrendered to Prabhupada, they all came with him. He gave them to Prabhupada. So now this was three years later. So in those course of those three years, many things had happened and so this ISKCON society is very different than how he would present Krishna consciousness. But he was giving class in the temple room that morning. So at the beginning of the class, of course, in Hawaii, the flower garland is very, very popular, just like here in India. Everybody, they, you know, call a lei. You'll see, anytime you see in Hawaii, you'll see they're putting garlands. You come in the airport from somewhere, People are putting garlands, these lays they put on you, very wonderful, fragrant flowers. So they had these garlands. So as Siddhas Roop started the class, of course, these devotees, they put the garland on him. And I said, that's okay. I said, but at the time, I said, your form was on the Vyasasan. I said, didn't have a garland. I said, and yet they garlanded him. I said, and so to many of us, that seems like that was wrong. And pra Prabhupada looked at him. He said, Shruta Kirti has a point. <laughs> and then at that time, Siddha said, well, Prabhupada, perhaps my preaching isn't proper, isn't good enough. And then Prabhupada looked at him, he said, well, if your preaching isn't good enough, he said, then you shouldn't be preaching. He said, unless you understand properly, he said, then better you hear. He said, until you're able to preach properly, then you. So then he, he just very humbly and he just, yes, Prabhupada, I, I agree. So it was a very interesting meeting. But this was our Prabhupada, huh? So now it's so many years later, that was 1975. How many years have gone by? 35, 45, almost 50 years later have gone by. We have so many different branches within ISKCON, outside of ISKCON. But for us, our potency, and it, it's always that, potency comes from following the spiritual master. Huh? Prabhupada, you know, he would often say, if I've done any miracle, he said that as I have not changed anything that has been given to me by my spiritual master. So many of us are in far corners of the world. As some would say that there in South Africa, you're far, far away from many places. But your potency is there. Our potency is there by understanding Prabhupada's instructions and following them, following them without making any changes. So wherever we are, these things can go on and, and everything will be perfect and the potency will be there. So I, you know, encourage you and I'm very happy that you keep Prabhupada also as your Prabhupada. Understand Prabhupada's instructions and in that way, give Krishna consciousness to others. And if all of you do that, all you Prabhus do that, you'll be very successful. Ultimately, that's our success. I was hearing today Prabhupada speaking, and he was talking about saintly persons, how the pure devotee. And he and, and I saw this with Prabhupada. You may remember Jagadananda Prabhu, Savyasachi Prabhu. When was I there? It was almost a year ago to the day when I was there with, with you all. In some ways, it seems like it was very, very long ago. In other ways, it seems like it was just last week. But it was literally just about a year ago. I saw I, I finally arrived in Kenya um, the middle of February. So I was right there in, in Cape Town and other places in South Africa in the last couple of weeks of January. And we both, we had a very wonderful time. And of course, you took very nice care of us while we were there in Cape Town. We felt so much at home. So this is what Krishna consciousness is about. 
And I had been, as I said, when I was there, I was so eager to travel to that part of the world because I had never been there before. And it was shortly after I left Prabhupada as his personal servant, I was with him until June of 1975. So one of the trips he made to Africa and South Africa was later, and Mauritius was towards the end of 1975. And I always regretted <laughs> that I didn't get to go. And I was always eager to go. So some by Krishna's arrangement and the different devotees there, they arranged that trip last year. And I got to see just what Prabhupada did. And that Prabhupada was saying in this class, he said, the pure devotee, he said he travels specifically. One of the reasons he travels is to purify wherever he goes. And this is what Prabhupada did. He turns any place into a tirtha. People come right now in Vrindavan, started a few days ago, five days ago. We're having Kumbha Mela in Vrindavan. It moves around every year. They have called mini Kumbha Melas. There's the big, big Kumbha Mela every 12 years where millions go. But this year they're having Kumbha Mela. It started five days ago in Vrindavan. They invested over 20 crores of rupees. They're really investing in this region to make this part of India, of course, where Krishna appeared, um, very famous holy place, very famous Tirtha, Vrindavan, Mathura, Govardhan, like that. In some ways, it's very nice, very wonderful. In other ways, for for some of us, it's it's also very difficult because what was a very sweet Vrindavan atmosphere village is turning into a city, <laughs> and instead of hearing peacocks, we hear rickshaws. You know, the horns from rickshaws and cars. But this is also due to Prabhupada literally putting Vrindavan on the map and giving people the opportunity to come to a holy place. But he said different things go on. Huh? He said when people, your average person, they come to a holy place, they come here and they literally dump their karma here. They dump their sins here. That's why they come, he says, and it happens. He said, of course, then they go back to wherever they're from and again begin committing sinful activities. And of course, at that point, he mentioned the Christians. They're, I would always talk about Christianity because they're famous for that. You, you get your sins forgiven, he said, then you go right back out and start sinning again. He said, and you dump those sins on Jesus. He said, but that's why they come to a holy place, is so that they can relieve themselves of their sinful activities. He said, but a saintly person, when he goes to a holy place, he purifies that place. So Prabhupada was so magnanimous, he traveled all around the world. This is why when you think 14 times around the world huh, in 10 years, a person in his 70s and 80s, but Prabhupada understood his potency. He never spoke about it in that way. He never said, I'm traveling around the world. Everywhere I go becomes a Tirtha. But he specifically said, a pure devotee travels wherever he goes. That place becomes purified. It becomes a place of pilgrimage. It becomes a sanctified place. And as I said, when I traveled around, I very much saw, I very much felt that all of you are recipients of Prabhupada's traveling. Huh? To, whatever particular place you're coming from. It's Prabhupada traveling there. He purified that place and he planted the seed of Krishna consciousness in so many people. That's, that's what I see everywhere I go. And as I said, um, very much like to see these places. For me, it's very encouraging that, that Prabhupada did that. I also see now Gita Gamya Devi. See, I remember... I remember, I remember many of you. I feel also um, just like you say, my Prabhupada, you people are also mine. Right? You all became very friendly. You did so much wonderful service. And uh, we both appreciate very much. 
we've also been blessed. We, after traveling to India, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, after traveling to Africa, we, we were literally in Mauritius in South Africa the entire month of December, January, and half of February. And by Krishna's arrangement, everything Krishna's arrangement, we arrived back in India on February 14th. And at that time, I had to do a little work on my body. I went to Bhaktivedanta Hospital in, in Mumbai. And we arrived in Vrindavan on March 2nd. My wife and I were on tourist visa. That means we get six months. We have US uh, Indian tourist visa from the US. So we get to stay here six months, go out, come back again. So March 2nd, we arrived in Vrindavan. And two weeks later, the whole of India just shut down, just like much of the world. Everything got locked down. So now we're at February 21st. We're still locked up in Vrindavan. <laughs> and we have no complaints. We're very happy. We've overstayed our visa for five months now. Every month or so, you just send in online. You write a little thing. And they keep extending it because India is still locked up to most everywhere in the world. But um, it was our intention to live in to live in Vrindavan and to travel from here and go back and forth. But for now, by the mercy of Prabhupada and Srimati Radharani, they locked us up in Vrindavan. And somehow or other, I don't know, you know, just like when I traveled to your country there. Um, I, I left, I left the shelter, direct ISKCON shelter living in a temple or living next to the temple in a temple apartment, which was in LA for some years. I left that in 1983. And I've basically been beside ISKCON since then. I've go to the temples, but I've been completely independent much like some of you are probably a little independently spirited. Huh? I've been just doing my service. I printed my book and would make my own travel arrangements, just like going, going to Africa, South Africa. It had nothing to do with it. I was part of some temple arranging it. It was just me wanting to go there. And fortunately, by, by um Prabhupada's mercy, Krishna's mercy, I've been able to do this for a many long time. But since being here in Vrindavan, Vrindavan, very special place. This Vrindavan, Prabhupada says this Vrindavan atmosphere. He talked about it. And uh, somehow or other, I find myself very involved. And it's just happened over the last, well, the last year, but specifically the last few months that I've actually become part of a temple. And that's very much due to the fact that I appreciate the temple president here very much, Panchagoda Prabhu, who's a good friend. He's been temple president here now for 11 years. And I've seen over those years how so many improvements have been made. And I see his style of management very much like Prabhupada's style of management. And that for me is very important. And, um, you know, I hope that in the time that I spent with you there, that you, you got that idea of just how personal uh, Prabhupada was in everything he did. And that's why I say this whole idea of my Prabhupada, you got to understand everything in Krishna consciousness, it's all personal. And it's up to us to come to that, that realization uh, through our service and through reading Prabhupada's books and following his instructions, and really prayer, because right? there's nothing more personal than prayer. So anyway, I um, we, we, <laughs> we've been very, very busy here lately, and as I wrote to Prabhu this morning, I even, for some reason, I thought I was giving class four or five hours ago, but I was thinking of some other country. I, I gave class to Russian devotees yesterday, and I've been, you know, by this, by this Zoom, Zooming around. I've been Zooming around the world off and on for the last year now in the USA and in England. I mean, everywhere. So it's very wonderful. But, 
but uh, sometimes I get a little confused about what I'm doing. But anyway, um, I, I do hope that sometime in the, in the future, in the near future or whenever, that uh, again, I get the opportunity to be with you all more personally and see how things are progressing there because I know there are many wonderful devotees there. And um, where this group, are you all around South Africa now or are you almost situated in one place? <laughs> so, with the initiative uh, was started in South Africa. Um, but my wife and myself are, are in Zimbabwe, and uh, uh -huh. two other devotees are also just listed just in different parts of South Africa. Good, good. Well, you keep doing what you're doing. It's very, very, it's very important. Eh? Your service is very important. And this is, you know, again, this was pra pra part of Prabhupada's traveling was to give, give himself. So it's the best thing we can do we can do for one another is, is give ourselves. I see your good wife there, you two getting along very nicely in Krishna consciousness. <laughs> She's smiling at least, that's a good sign. My, my wife also, she's, she's working in the Pujari department here at Krishna Balaram Mandir, which is an amazing thing because um, Pretty much, this is Vrindavan. You know, Vrindavan is, even Prabhupada said in Vrindavan, he said it wasn't possible women could be on the altar. He said, because they wouldn't accept us in that way. You know, Vrindavan has its own, its own way of doing things. Just like wherever you go in the world, certain cultures are there. So Prabhupada understood that and he made his adjustments. That's what the devotee can understand. You adjust things according time, place, so the place and circumstances. So it's been that way in Vrindavan for a long, long time. 24-hour kirtan goes on with, you know, all men group. It's been going on that way for some 40 years now. And, uh, but there, there was something that was kind of lacking here for some time. And, and it had to do with like the deity's outfits, keeping them nice and pressed and cleaned and refreshing them, getting him some little sunshine and cleaning all of the jewelry. And she literally has developed a, a whole department. And it's basically all women cleaning all the deities' paraphernalia. And this for them is just amazing. They're getting to personally hold the flutes of Shama Sundar and Krishna Balaram and polishing their crowns and and all of their outfits. So they're they're overwhelmed in happiness in doing this service. So um, some of you may remember her. She's a very strong-willed devotee lady. Huh? I'm sure you do. And uh, but because of it, she's has been able to do exactly what she's doing. So um anyway, we're we're very happy here, and we hope we can continue here. She's also in, in Prabhupada's room. This is, this is amazing. Huh? She's in, in Prabhupada's house here. There's many, many cabinets with all of Prabhupada's personal items in them. His, his japa beads, his, his watches, chatters, clothing, his cooker. So all these different cabinets where things have been donated, it's become very much like part of Prabhupada Museum here where they keep, keep all these things locked up. And she's in charge of she's in charge of cleaning these things as well. So um, she has the keys. So the same thing. She brings these ladies in, and just like they did when Prabhupada was here, it was always the the women, the matujis, that cleaned Prabhupada's room. When Prabhupada would be on a morning walk with all the men, the women were doing all the work. The women were doing all the pajari service. The women were doing the cleaning in Prabhupada's room and making the vases and doing the cooking and so many things. So this was Prabhupada's mercy on all of us. He engaged us all according to our propensities. So um, she has that. So now they're literally, I went in one day and they had Prabhupada's slippers and one of the matajis was just holding him on her head and just crying because no one gets no one gets to do these things. So 
you know, this everything is based huh, on desire. Like I, I'm sure in the, in the classes I gave, I told that uh, told one of my stories. Very, it's a very special story. It, everything we do, we just have to desire. So it's important for all of us, no matter what's going on, no matter what difficulties may be there, that we always understand Krishna is going to take care of everything. And we just, as Prabhupada said, you just give this lifetime for Krishna and everything good will happen. And sometimes he takes things away so that we, <laughs> so that we can make advancement in Krishna consciousness. But ultimately, he just gives himself. And Prabhupada, very much the same. Um, let me see. I'm glad to see the participants. We have over 20 devotees here. It's very nice. I gave a class in Russia the other day, a Zoom class. They maxed out. It was 500. 500 devotees. Imagine, Prabhupada went to Russia for one week. But the very same thing, it's the potency of Srila Prabhupada. So you all have to be very aware that being connected to this society, you can get all your desires fulfilled. There's, there's no lack. I know sometimes it's said that, that our ISKCON society is a beginner this and this and that. But there's no question that Prabhupada's potency and as he said, if, if you just do your service, everything comes. And like I say, here in Vrindavan, I, I've seen that, I've seen that very much. It was our desire to come live in Vrindavan. And um, just by Krishna's arrangement, by Prabhupada's mercy, now, we, now we've got to be here. Don't know what's there in the future, but wherever it is, Prabhupada's brought Vrindavan everywhere, all around the world. Um, I know it's a little, little bit early, but I guess not. And it's an hour class. We can see if there's any questions or anything anyone wants to discuss. We could, we could do that. Uh. Hi, Krishna Prabhu. Thank you. Um, yeah, we do have one question that's just popped up in the chat. This comes from uh, Bhaktamanda. So he's asking, Hare Krishna Prabhu, thank you so much for your time and the wonderful class. I would like to ask whether Prabhupada found it difficult at times to balance being a spiritual master, um, sorry, a spiritual leader or guru, as well as being a leader of an international organization or movement. Mm. Um. <laughs> I, I mean, of course, just being in this material world, sometimes difficulties are there. You know, Prabhupada said, even when Krishna comes here, he, you know, demons are attacking him. And on the surface, it must might appear like some difficulties are there. But in a sense, the pure devotee, he welcomes, you know, we know the prayers of Queen Kunti. Um, Devotee welcomes the opportunity or even the most adverse conditions because it helps us remember Krishna. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, while I was a brahmachari, I was with Prabhupada. Um, half the time I was with him, I was a brahmachari, and then I was away for six months, and then I was again with him as a grahasta. And you know, that was also with Prabhupada. He didn't make distinctions. He didn't deal with me any differently as a grahasta than he did as when I was a brahmachari. He just saw I was servant. And he would take care of me. He took care of me in the very same way. He didn't, didn't see any of these bodily designations, whether it be the ashram you're in, the color you are, the age you are. Everything was based on what we could do, what our... Um, what our nature was, and he engaged us in service. But when I was a brahmachari, and again, I didn't, I didn't always understand. Prabhupada would talk to me sometimes. I could walk into the room, and he would just say simple things. He knew me very well. He Prabhupada didn't, didn't preach to me. He would 
he made it sound like he was just speaking very generally. He preached, but it didn't. He didn't make it sound like he was preaching to me, because he understood, as I said, my very independent nature that, that I had. So I, when I was a brahmachari, you know, every day at lunchtime I prepared his lunch, and then I would bring it in and put it down on the table, little table which was on the floor. Called, they call it a choki in 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 uh, Hindi. Just, you know, eight inches, just like a little TV table that you would sit on the floor or on a, t on a counter. And he would sit on a straw mat on the floor and he faced the wall. This was just how he did it in Vrindavan. Everywhere he went, he not only brought Vrindavan in the spiritual sense, he brought Vrindavan very literally. His rooms were very simple. Prabhupada was comfortable sitting on a cushion on the floor, his back up against the wall, a little table in front of him. It's what he had in Vrindavan. It's what he had in Los Angeles, in New York. It's what he had in a very opulent place in, at Bhaktivedanta Manor in England. Everywhere. He didn't have couches and dining room tables and chairs. He was happy in simplicity. So anyway, I would bring the plate in, put it down, offer obeisances, and Prabhupada start eating. Then I would run back out of the room, make another japati, run back into the room, put it down on the table, offer obeisances, and run back out again. So I could do that five, six times. So one day when I was brahmachari, I came in, I brought the japati, I slid it onto his plate, offered obeisances, and Prabhupada as I was offering obeisances, Prabhupada said to me, being brahmachari, he said, is austerity. He said, and being a grahasta is an austerity. He said, you just have to decide what austerity you want to accept. See, he was talking to me. I was a brahmachari, and I had been with him for a year, and I'm sure he could see that I was losing that determination in my brahmachari life but he didn't he didn't sit me down and say look this is you know this is the situation and you should seriously consider no he just made this what seemed to me like a very general statement and i walked out made another japati brought it in he didn't say anything else during that lunchtime so then the very next day, 24 hours later, I bring in his plate, I go back out, get another japati, run into the room, put the japati, slide it onto his plate, you know, the japati's puffed up, push it down with his hand. And as I'm offering obeisances and getting up, he said, it was more difficult, he said, managing my household life than it is managing ISKCON. <laughs> and then again I went out of the room but it went right over my head I didn't understand what he was telling me that he was he was advising me but this is how this is how again he preached you have to know whenever whoever when if you're a preacher in order to be a good preacher you have to understand who you're speaking to you have to understand your audience very well and what they're able to digest at any moment. Because if you say something they can't digest, then the whole meal is spoiled, huh? just like eating. You know, you eat one thing, doesn't go down, your whole meal is spoiled. So we can say so many things, but if, if we say something that's not easy to accept, then everything is done. So Prabhupada, he said it to me in such a way that I never even realized, literally until many, many years later, he was always telling me what to do. He was always telling me what was best for me. But with that said, you know, of course there were difficulties within the society. They're, they're always there, just like they're here now. They were there when Prabhupada was there. But when you're a pure devotee, you, accept, you understand 100%. You understand completely that ultimately Krishna's in charge and and as we say and not a blade of grass moves without krishna's sanction 
And Prabhupada would very often say, like he did with Sankirtan, we say Sankirtan devotees, book distributors, he would, you know, say, whatever happens, our business is not the result. Our business is just to do the service. So pure devotee, ultimately, he knows everything is up to Krishna. But at the same time, as devotees, we never want to become complacent and think that, well, Krishna will do it. No, our business is to try. But if things work out or not, that's up to Krishna. I always think of the one instance with Prabhupada. He had his Bhagavad Gita manuscript hmm, that was sold off as just scrap paper. You know, in India, to this day, you're in different places. You can hear people shouting from the window. They collect your scrap paper. They'll collect plastic. You know, you have knife sharpeners. You know, might go on in, in Africa in different villages. These village activities go on. So the one day, person was scrap, and his wife gave away his entire Bhagavad Gita manuscript. Now, if one's not very advanced, they could think, oh, finished. I, that's Krishna's desire. I don't do that. But Prabhupada didn't see things like that. He again, he redid the whole thing again. You know, so devotee never gives up within his service. If there's a service he has the opportunity to do, he accepts that service. And despite any challenges, he carries on with that service. So um, Prabhupada, he very much appreciated his disciples. He knew we were children in Krishna consciousness. We were always making mistakes. Hmm? Perhaps we we're still always making some mistakes. But uh, just like your, you know, just like your your Google Maps, you know, if you make a wrong turn, it just readjusts everything to get you back to the same place. So even as we struggle in our Krishna consciousness, if something doesn't go right, Krishna just readjusts everything. The spiritual master readjusts, and we carry on from that position. So Prabhupada was always happy in Krishna consciousness. He says, as devotees, we accept struggle for Krishna, but that struggle is also pleasure. Everything in service, we take it as Krishna's mercy, and we accept it. It's somehow or other, it's enjoyment. That's our pleasure, because we're getting to serve Krishna. And that ultimately is always pleasurable. The only thing Prabhupada said he didn't like I never heard him use the word hate, but he said he hated sleep. <laughs> he said it was just a waste of time. He said, whenever I go to sleep, I think now I'm going to waste my time. But then right after he said it, he just laid down and pulled the sheet over his head, as I've told you. So even that was, you know, so all these different feelings are there. Just like we all, we feel we don't like this, but still. It's okay. It's it's what we do. Whatever Krishna gives us, that we accept. Okay, I see these messages. John, thank you so much. That was very very nice answer. We have another question from uh, Mother Rimuna here, and it uh, goes: Hare Krishna, Prabhu. You mentioned that uh, Prabhupada said that his success was due to the fact that he did not change anything. However, we see that to make Krishna conscious more accessible to people, he did make adjustments, as in giving ladies second initiation. Thus, how can we distinguish between making changes and making required adjustments according to time, place, and circumstance in order to facilitate more people embracing the process of Krishna consciousness? Mm. Yes, good question. Um, you know, in my very first days with Prabhupada, as we were traveling to Vrindavan, Prabhupada was very aware he was going to spend the entire month of Vrindavan, or the entire month of Kartik in Vrindavan. This was 1972. Vrindavan, of course, very special place. You have this Goswami's temples are there. They've been there for hundreds of years. 
and they have their understanding. Many of them thought Prabhupada initiating these Westerners was just Maya, they're all Maleches, they're not qualified. Was very much, you know, within India, and it still exists in many places that um, Westerners are not qualified to be devotees. Only one born in a Brahmin family, or at least only one born in India, outside of India, it was considered even to leave India was Maya in many circles. That's considered just like Prabhupada leaving India, he went into Maya leaving this sacred land of Bharat Barsha. So as he was working his way to India, I'm sure he was thinking about what he was doing. Imagine he went to Vrindavan, 1972 Kartik, and he had a jagya right there at the Samadhi of Rupa Goswami. And he gave first initiation, he gave second initiation, and he initiated devotees as sannyasis. So this was something that was just outrageous to many people. But for Prabhupada, he was proud to do it. And I'm not sure, maybe some of those ladies were all, uh, some of the initiates were also women at that time, I don't remember. But before he got there, one day I was massaging him and one of his early disciples, Burajan Prabhu, who came in like 1968, I was massaging Prabhupada's back, and, and Burajan said, Prabhupada, or no, Prabhupada said, he said, so he said, my God brothers, they criticize me because I allowed women into the temple. He said, in India, no women in the temple, temple for brahmacharis. He said, and they criticized me for this. He said, but after getting to America, he said, for a year, he said, I studied. He said, I studied your, your people. In other words, he studied the Westerners and he could see there was no question of separating men and women. He said, in order to spread Krishna consciousness, had to be for everyone. And of course, that's what Lord Chaitanya said. Every town and village, it was for everyone. He said, but they criticize me. He said, but if you go to Mayapur, he said, big festival days, he said, the only time anyone comes, he said, who is in the temple? He said, it's nothing but women. He said, widows in white. It's women coming to the temple. He said, and yet they criticize me. He said, but because I made that adjustment, we were successful. It means he was successful. Prabhupada never took credit personally, yeah? also pure devotee, the way he would speak. He said, but because I made that adjustment, we've been successful. I was massaging him, I'm behind him. I've only been with, with him literally for a week. I've only been so-called devotee. Yeah? serving in the temple now for 16 months when I became his servant. And I said, Prabhupada, what's the difference between changing a principle and making an adjustment? It was probably the best question I ever asked Prabhupada. And it got very quiet. And then after a little time, Prabhupada said, that requires little intelligence. So we have to be very careful not to change principles. What are the principles? Prabhupada, just like right now in the 10th canto, we're reading about um, the birth of Krishna, uh, birth of Krishna, Vasudeva and Devaki and Nanda Maharaj, and Mother Yasoda, and, and now Krishna has been delivered to Vrindavan, Nanda Maharaj putting on big, big festival, donating 2 million cows to the Brahmanas, big fire juggies, everyone's, you know, brought in the, the Brahmins, the chant Vedic mantras. These were all things that were done at this time huh? well, when Krishna appeared. This, this was the principles of devotional life, of practicing Krishna consciousness, of Vedic culture. These were the principles that were there at that time as well. Prabhupada, Bhakti Siddhanta, his spiritual master, and then Prabhupada 
Lord Chaitanya gave us a very simple formula. All these other things, worship of the demigods, <laughs> chanting all these different mantras, Vedic mantras, everything has been set aside. He gave the process, chanting Hare Krishna. Prabhupada gave processes which he said is just human life, following the four regulative principles, no meat eating, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no gambling. Prabhupada said, this is just human life to follow these principles. And then he added the chanting of 16 rounds. So there are the principles. The adjustments that the devotee can see. When one is pure, they can see what they need to do, what adjustments need to be there so that these things go on. Prabhupada was careful. He liked to keep everything very simple, just as Lord Chaitanya presented it. Nice, simple kirtan, where one could concentrate on the holy name. Prabhupada didn't like us to get caught up in instrumentation. Not that instruments couldn't be there, but the whole point of chanting is to hear and chant. Have Krishna on your tongue and to hear with the ear. So anything that interfered with that, he didn't, he didn't care for, for that. You know, he wanted that the chanting be very pure. For Krishna's pleasure, he said, and if you chant for Krishna's pleasure, automatically others that are sincere, that are looking, they'll be attracted because Krishna is also in their heart. So it's not that we try to go out and seek people individually. Our whole goal 24 hours a day is to please Krishna. And if that's our goal, everything else will happen. Prabhupada's program was always 24 hours. He says every moment. He said a pure devotee is every moment thinking of Krishna. And it's by that potency he was able to do what he did. So, um, you know, he also promoted very, very much just like our diet. Everything was cooked in ghee. Um, offered, offered to the lordships. You know, I put some funny things online. Sometimes I put a plate of all these sweets. One of my godbrothers said, that's too much sugar. He said, excuse me, that's too much sugar. I said, why should I excuse you? I said, this isn't for you. This was offered to Krishna. He's, he's not, he doesn't get diabetes. He likes sugar. Krishna likes sugar. Krishna likes milk products. I said, no one's pushing this down your throat. You can eat your tofu and your brown rice and all these things to keep healthy. That you figure out for yourself. But we're trying to please Krishna. And me, I'm this year, I'm 70 years old. I don't have high blood pressure. I don't have high sugar content. So if I want to eat these sweets that were offered to Krishna, I'll also do that in moderation. So, so adjustments we can make not only society, but even as individuals, we make our adjustments in order to be healthy and to serve Krishna nicely. But some things that are set there by Prabhupada. So we should, you know, we, we should find those that understand and can help us progress that way in Krishna consciousness. Does that make sense? Yeah, that was very, very to the point. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you we have a, a question from Ram. I beg your pardon? He said, you remember when I was there, what I ate, right? <laughs> I feel very healthy. Yeah, you're, I, you're, you're, I, eat, I, I like to eat Italian pizza, pasta, cheese, <laughs> but also like my sweets. Yes. I, I remember distinctly. You said you fry and ghee, so that's what I remember. What do you remember? Lost you there. Okay, now I'm back, sorry. Uh, we have a question from uh, Ramin Kaadas. Um, I didn't quite understand his question on the chat, so Prabhu, would you like to clarify your question here? Ramin Ka Prabhu? Uh Hare Krishna, thank you for this wonderful forum. Uh, and to his grace, Shruti Kirti Prabhu, it's nice to hear you all the time. Thank you. And 
And uh, I'm surprised you're 7 0. Oh, what a big digit. And you're looking like 16. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, 7 0. Oh, yes, I've this year. Well, thank you. If, if I, I see my many photos and videos on Opa, but I appreciate your, I appreciate your comment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming online. My humble request is, can we have you every Sunday, at least for half an hour to an hour, <laughs> with a little bit of nectar that uh, we all were denied of due to time, place, circumstances. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you can share those uh, wonderful uh, anecdotes with Prabhupada when he was the uh, world acharya. I just said it was difficult to manage a household life, but easier <laughs> to manage an international society. And Who could uh, imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and we are at a, at a crossroads now. Uh, the movement has grown so well under his leadership and it left such a profound legacy, um, just like the politician Nelson Mandela did for South Africa, you know, in terms of. Uh, uh, peaceful transition. So here we are talking about the transition of the soul, the spiritual soul in union, in yoga, in bhakti yoga with Krishna. My question here is, um, it's personal, uh, that sometimes we all want to connect with the Supreme Spirit and um, ISKCON is the perfect entity or facility or shelter to uh, invite more souls, as you said, to get the shelter and the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead rather than Krishna. So sometimes you find that management is heavy um, in terms of not understanding uh, people's moods and mission. And they find they get to become quickly threatened for, by the, uh, their position. Mm. And hence they, what they do in inverted commas, ban some good devotees that can make good paramedics that can save many lives. How do we uh, implement or try and fix these problems that are now coming up as time goes by? You have a vast amount of experience. Mm. And if you could please also repeat that uh, introduction. I like your introduction. And, and I think that introduction is what we're experiencing today in modern day ISKCON and the world at large. And how we can unite the different fragments in ISKCON come back together and serve Prabhupada united like a united nations. Mm. The, the <laughs> it's a lot of questions. <laughs> Thank you for uh, ending it with such a simple question. <laughs> uh, you, you know, I like I said myself, I spent, you know, I'll, I'll tell you frankly, I, I lived it by Bhaktivedanta Manor for eight years. I was five minutes away from the temple. I did all my service traveling around, but whenever I was there, I, I kept very, could I say very aloof? I think in seven years, I gave maybe seven classes in the temple there. Um, I spent years in Hawaii, the last five years before traveling to Africa, I spent in Hawaii. And even though I've been regional secretary and now they call it zonal supervisor, I um I didn't get very involved. I, you know, I understood what my service was, which is what I'm doing here, traveling about, speaking to devotees, whoever want to hear about Prabhupada, and trying to give instructions in that way how Prabhupada did things to those that were interested in listening. Um you know, as I say, you, you, you can't beat a dead horse. Uh, sometimes you just have to find a different ranch. You know, you just, you just find a place where your association, where your knowledge, where your whatever your service is, is appreciated. Um, here in Vrindavan, I see that with the temple president, at least it is appreciated. He, he appreciates my advice. You know, they have 30 departments, over 30 departments here in Vrindavan, you know, and, and hundreds of devotees um, that are involved in service at the temple. And, you know, now I find myself on part of Chaita uh, Child Protection. I'm on the Vaishnava Care. 
I'm on the uh, human resources, community services. So he welcomes my services. So because he welcomes it, I find myself involved in doing different things. So I guess, um, but at the same time, it, it didn't, you know, when I was in England, the fact that everything went on with around me and no one was really interested, nor was I interested in being involved closer because, you know, frankly, I would have become discouraged because if I see things going in a certain way and I don't think that way is um, what Prabhupada wanted, you know, and I have that, I have a disease in me, you know, I have this infection in me being with Prabhupada for a long time. So I see things in very certain way. And it was how he did things. And I protected myself by not putting myself in a situation where I would myself become discouraged, you know. And at the same time, I found I would always find that spot where I could do the service that was encouraging for me. And, and to this day, it's the same thing. I, you know, I've, everything is personal. And I find myself dealing with devotees very personally. And even being, you know, not stuck here, being locked up here in Vrindavan, I'm doing classes as, as people approach me and ask. I give classes all around the world. Um, how much success that is, whether I'm speaking to two or 200, you know, I don't, I don't know. But um, for me, it's good because I also get to remember Prabhupada. I get to feel Prabhupada's presence, be close with Srila Prabhupada, and just try to do something. So whatever is going on personally in our lives, you just have to find that situation where you can always be serving and doing the best you can in Krishna's service. And as one devotee told me, a god sister who was born and raised in Hawaii, she said, um, you know, when, when you live by the ocean, and especially if you're a surfer, you learn to ride the waves. And if there isn't a wave there, don't, you know, you, no matter what you do, you're not going to get anywhere. So you have to know, or as one famous song back in the day, also Western song, you know, you got to know when the fold your hand, you know, when you play poker, you got to know when to fold, you got to know when to hold them. So you're, you know, you're not a young, you know, you're not a youngster, you've been around a long time. So we have to know where we can be effective and what we can do to be effective wherever we are. You know, whether you're there where you are, where I am, you know, don't, you know, you're not going to help yourself or anybody else by just being a, a, you know, a thorn in the side and saying, well, no, it should be like this. And we should be doing, if people are listening, great. But if they're not, then, you know, you can't ride that wave. And, you know, I see that very much. You know, I see that more and more. Krishna is in control. You know, not everything is perfect anywhere. Not even here, you know, in Iskam Vrindavan. There's so many things that I also see that I would think it shouldn't be like that, it should be like this. But for one reason or another, you know, sometimes you can't do anything. So you find where you can be effective, where you are, and do that for Krishna, do that for Prabhupada, do that for Prabhupada's society. And outside of that, you know, I mean, I, I don't, you know, no particulars, you know, sometimes people ask, what should I do? And I'll say, look, I don't know you. I don't know where you live. I don't know what your situation is. I say, you can't ask me those questions. I can only speak on philosophical level, you know. And Prabhupada would always say, chant your rounds, follow the principles, you know, read my books, and you carry on from there. So that's what I, whoops, hold on a sec. That's what I do understand is that our services, we can always do service in any situation. But sometimes, Maybe our service is literally to just sit back, chant our rounds, and read Prabhupada's books, and and wait for something else to appear. You know, and uh, but preaching is always there. You know, and if 
we can always go out and preach to the innocent wherever we are. So I hope that kind of answers your question.